All right. Hi, everybody. Looks like we're live and well, welcome to um, this Domestic Alive. Um, we're going to be talking about um, community management and how to build an engaged audience on your platforms. So I'd be happy to hear where you're um, listening from today and um, it'd be great if you could say hi before we just begin. I'm actually just sitting here in London, so um, here in our apartment, here in my apartment, and yeah, so I think that we can probably just start. But before I actually move on to um, you know talking about community management. Um, I think it would be best just to introduce myself and, you know, just talk a little bit about uh, my experience and, you know, how I actually got to social media management and marketing. So, um, well, first of all, um, my name is Hannah Jake Lochner and um, I'm a social media marketing specialist and I've been in digital marketing for um, over 13 years now. And um, my actual experience really at the beginning, it comes from blogging. Um, so that was around 2007 when I, you know, started blogging. Blogging was just getting popular. It was like a new, um, you know, way of communication. It was just getting really, you know, popular. So um, I started blogging for um, an Apple magazine. And, you know, as soon as I realized that there was a huge potential, um, you know, in um, the online platforms and, you know, just online communication, and soon after that, I decided that I'm just going to la launch my own platforms. And I launched a fashion blog, which was more like a community blog. Um, I had a couple of editors, and then I also had another blog, which was more like a video gaming platform. Um, and they both, you know, got to kind of, um, I could say popular to some extent. Um, and I led them for a couple of years, and then I actually decided to sell them. And well, you know, before I did that, I actually, um, you know, at some point um, around, it was 2013, I moved to Prague and, you know, I was actually just out of school and I was looking for, a, for my first job. And so obviously I was looking for a job, you know, that would be something around blogs or it would be something around online communication. And actually I found a job, which was kind of a, um, Bit of a surprise. I moved to a different country, um, but I found a job in in the country where I'm from, which is Slovakia. So I started working from Prague externally as a social media manager, and um, I managed um, these companies. They were selling Apple accessories, um, so things like cases, but really nice cool cases for iPhones and um, you know MacBooks, etc. And um, I started as, you know, just a social media manager. I was looking after their social media platforms, mainly at the time that was Facebook. And soon, soon on, we moved, into, moved on to um, Instagram. And yeah, I think that we had just Instagram and also some, a little bit of Pinterest. Um, very soon after that, I also worked with a small team of people and, you know, we were translating everything into a number of languages, um, producing, you know, newsletters, um, email communication and everything like that. So I got really engaged with the online communication, but, you know, social media um, was really just becoming my new passion through this job. Um, and around the same time in 2013, uh, when I moved to Prague, I started working from um, a co-working space. Um, and basically, one day they asked me that, you know, we're having this um, community event and we would like our members to actually, you know, um, you know, present some skills that they have. And Hannah, we heard that you're really great at blogging. You've done a lot of that. Um, you know, is there anything that you could share about blogging? So I was thinking, well, sounds like a good idea, but you know, I've never done any public speaking. Um, 
and I never worked with a group before in a, you know, in like one room. So it was a completely new experience for me, but I decided, yeah, let's just do it. Let's just, tr let's just try it. And, you know, I thought um, afterwards, I mean, it went really great. Um, the, the workshop was completely full. There were no empty chairs and nothing like that. Actually, um, people were fighting a little bit for the space to my surprise. And, you know, people liked it and I thought, why don't I do this maybe more often? So that's really how my experience with um, training and consultancy started. Um, it was really just through, um, you know, starting my own workshops in Prague. And, you know, since then, I never really looked back. I started doing those um, blogging workshops um, every week, um, sorry, every month, a week would be a little bit too often. Um, but yeah, every month I did those and they were doing pretty good. And I actually didn't last in Prague, unfortunately, for too long. It's such a great city. Um, but in, um, in less than a year, I actually moved out of Prague because, you know, to my big surprise, I actually um, met my now husband in Prague. So he was all about, yeah, I want to move to London. I want to go somewhere else. So, you know, um, I had a kind of a choice, either choose Prague or, you know, um, something that looked like a promising relationship. And I'm obviously glad I went for the relationship. So we moved to London together. And I'll be honest, I actually struggled a little bit when I moved here. Um, it's a completely different culture. It's a very different market. And, you know, so um, for the first year, I was just literally just exploring all the different options. And I found that there was so much competition for, um, you know, workshops and trainings. And there was... It wasn't really like Prague. In Prague, you could do like hundreds of things. But in London, you could do probably a couple thousands of things every night. And I just didn't know really how, you know, how to really um, put myself out there. So just about roughly a year later, uh, when I arrived to London, I decided, um, you know, I may just as well... Um, maybe find some education center and offer my blogging course to them. I'm sure there has to be, um, you know, um, some, you know, um, demand for that. And people need to, there definitely have to be like um, interested in that. And obviously I spoke to other people and they said, yes, it would. So I started looking at different places where I could actually continue teaching my course. Um, but I wouldn't have to do all the promotion myself only. And it was a pure luck, I suppose, a little bit of that. Um, but there's, there was just a university just around the corner from uh, where we live. And, you know, I actually wanted to take their courses when I came to London. And then, you know, when I was thinking about all these educational centers, I thought, but hold on, these guys, this university and the University of the Arts London, they also have, um, you know, just short courses. It's not a really like, um, you know, you don't have to do like a full time education, but it can be just like a two day course or a day course. And I really loved that idea. And, you know, I was like, I was I went there actually to the uni like this tiny, like feeling this tiny, you know, and um I go to somebody in, in the office and I asked them, you know, do you, do you have any courses like this? Because I was looking online and I couldn't find it. And would you be interested in having one? And, you know, they looked at my um, presentation. They looked at my portfolio and my CV. Um, and they said, you know, just, yeah, I mean, this looks kind of good, actually. But we just need to have a little bit like a longer course. And well, that was actually it. They let me know in two weeks that um, I could teach the course at um, uni. Um, so that's the University of the Arts London. And I was just thrilled. So yeah, that's, that's how I really started with the local university here in London. And I think that, you know, it's been probably one of the best things that I've ever done because I got really, you know, in, in touch with um, so many people. And well, you know, it really took off afterwards. I I was I was doing a um, I was doing a um, um, you know I started to freelance, but um, you know I kind of needed to kick that off, and the uni really helped that. Uh, so that was one thing. Um, and 
Uh, then also, you know, I started teaching at a different university just about a year ago. That's Istituto Marangoni, uh, which is a fashion Italian university where obviously I do teach marketing, no, no, nothing with fashion. Um, but I moved from, you know, just freelancing to actually starting my own company. And um, now I run a business. Um, I'm an agency owner. I do consultancy and training typically for small to medium-sized companies. Um, and um, I would do things like audits uh, and I would also uh, do uh, st strategies for small to medium-sized companies and for their social media, uh, but also train their staff. So this is pretty much what I do most of my time. Um, and um, some of my biggest clients that I've trained uh, were, for example, um, the fashion division of Amazon. Um, I also trained some people from the UN. Um, and also um, I trained some people uh, from a company called G GLH Hotels. Um, and they're the biggest hospitality business in London. They have kind of like the most rooms um, in whole London when you put all their hotels together. So, yeah, I think that's just a little bit about uh, myself um, and, um, you know, how I got to be in social media marketing and became a social media specialist. Um, there probably one thing I have to admit is that, you know, I've always had, I mean, I used to have probably no, not I've always, but I used to have um, kind of a love hate relationship with social media, to be quite honest. Um, but it has completely transformed at some point, and I would never look back. Um, and I completely love it these days. But actually, what I understand is that my you know clients or even students at the uni didn't have to be the same. I would completely say it's completely fine. Uh, you know, if you're um, not 100%, uh, you know, loving everything about social media. And um, my role, really, my job is really to, you know, get that and understand that. Um, and when I work with clients, it's not that they have to love it, but what I really want for them are the results. And I want to really make it easy for them because I think that, you know, social media can, you know, just be so overcomplicated about how people talk about it. Um, and I think that, you know, it can be just done so much easier. So that's what that's what I'm really always trying to do. So anyways, I think that's, you know, everything that you should know about myself. I know it was um quite a story. So I think let's just move on to, um, you know, the today's content and actually having a look at um, community management. So um, when it comes to community management, the first thing that I would like to do is to really explain the difference between community management and social media management, because these two terms sometimes get um, really confused and people don't really see um, what's the difference. So that's what I would just like to make clear. So, you know, when it comes to um, social media management, social media management is all about, um, you know, planning your content, creating your content, um, scheduling your content, publishing it. Um, even editing it, writing copies, and then finally analyzing it. And typically that would be done, you know, within certain structures. So you would have a strategy that you are following, but it's just like all about the, it's mostly the, the content creation is involved. And then what's also involved is, um, you know, the publishing uh, and uh, the, anal the analyzing part, the analytics part. Yes. Yeah, so, um, that's what is included in social media management. So what you can see here, for example, on my in my picture here, what you see is um, an editorial calendar from a third party app, which I really love. It's um, it's called Planoly and it's for planning your Instagram content. Um, so 
that would be just you know the planning or here you can see this is also in Planoly, but what you can see this is from the end this is their analytic tools so you know i can see you know all about my followers and i can see where they come from and i can see um everything about um you know my engagement and how people engage with my content so it's more like content based and again planning scheduling analytics but when it comes to um, community management, that's just a slightly different story. So um, the person who is in charge of community management is actually, I would say that community management is actually the, the human, the very human part of social media. Um, because the community manager, you know, he's taking care of all those interactions that happen online, um, on social media especially. Um, and, you know, he's really trying to represent the brand and show the brand in the best light possible. And sometimes either just engage with the, with the community that there is, or actually even create a whole new community for the brand, you know, through different ways of engagement. So um, it's a really powerful um, thing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's actually a whole new job to be in community management. Um, typically, the biggest pitfall for a lot of companies is that, um they will have um they will have a social media manager but um you know they're going to you know kind of um the social media the, the social media manager can get a little bit busy with their um you know day-to-day -day, um work and they kind of forget all about you know the communication and the communication part is really crucial because it's like this is where you really start to um, notice the brand and you start to think about it as like um, more of like a personal thing um, or actually almost like, you know, give it a personality. Um, and that's the biggest difference that a community manager can do for you. Uh, like the brand, the brand really comes alive. So if you probably, you know, think about a good brand uh, that you really like, um, you know, and they typically respond to you, uh, you know, they might like repost your um, pictures that you posted on stories to their stories. This is basically community management and you kind of like, oh, I love that. Like they did it for me. This is what a community manager will do for you. Now, what you see here in my picture, um, this is actually um, a picture taken from Facebook uh, from my own page. And um, as you can see here, this is like my message box for um, Facebook and Instagram. So I can see, um, you know, all the posts that, uh, I mean, I can see all the comments that people have posted. And one, um, one of the key things about um, community management is, um, you know, moderating these comments um, and responding to them. So, um, this is what I can do with this tool online. So this is this is the biggest difference between the community management um, and social media management. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to continue now actually giving you, um, you know, a little bit like an idea about social media platforms and user habits. Um, now, why this topic and why is it important? So, um, well, first of all, um, I like to say that, you know, social media is actually really easy, but we like to make it very complicated. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think that social media is all about those, um, you know, tiny little technical parts and really learning about, um, you know, um, all these technicalities and special tools that are inside of the platforms. But the truth is that, um, you know, these little settings or options
options or you know technical parts of social media platforms they can change quite often and quite frequently you know and what was two weeks ago uh you know is going to be maybe different in a month um and in half a year you know the platform looks completely different from you know what it used to be so um it's really important to kind of you know think about social media not just as like you know it's just these little technical things but especially when you're in um community management more as you know your community and who are the people and how they use the platforms and i find that you know knowing all about the user habits is probably the most important things i think because if you understand how people kind of take on each of the platforms you're going to understand you know how um you know how they're going to interact what they're going to expect from you and how they want you to communicate or you know how they want you to show up as a brand and sometimes what is actually considered you know completely normal on one platform will be a completely forbidden thing on the other one so i mean i think probably a very good example of that would be um if you look at instagram um you know a company can actually um send you a direct message without asking you for any permission to do that now obviously you have to do it very well so it doesn't look kind of weird because the company writing you a message can look a little bit odd but for but you can't do that at all on facebook yes yeah? so you know like what is actually available to you on one platform it doesn't have to be on the other one but it's all about also managing the expectations it's like a little bit of a contextual thing um you know when people are on um facebook um they always think about facebook especially their personal account as that because they call it friends who i can add to my profile i'm just going to keep it to my friends and my family and you typically don't think about using your personal profile as you know a way how to actually build your audience despite actually a lot of people do that so it's just you know that those were the differences i wanted to mention so let's just actually look at um you know the three um most popular platforms for um community management so um the first one is instagram that i would pick uh obviously because it's just so popular right now and you know when you say um instagram everybody everybody's face kind of like lights lit up you know it's like oh wow I, i love instagram um and a lot of people think simply because it's so popular that um you know it's the biggest platform but what's quite specific about instagram is that um when it comes to the users uh they're always looking for inspiring curated branded content and you know they actually don't care that you're a brand um as long as your content is good and it's interesting they will you know love looking at um you know um your content whether it's you know a product or not but it has to be interesting you know it has to be engaging at some point so that's really important and also what's quite important about instagram is that people don't care if you are an established brand or a completely new one in fact people love new brands so you know um if you you are actually in advantage if you are um an emerging brand because people love um looking at ads which is also quite a typical thing for instagram and um another thing is that um you know instagram used to be this like a vanity platform but right now there is this really great balance between kind of portraying yourself or your brand as like really in a perfectionist way and with the stories it's just kind of creating this a bit of a reality check um and it's just making it a little bit more authentic um another thing is that when it comes to um instagram probably one of the most popular things to do or you know things you will see um kind of happening with brands is that they will use a lot of um brand ambassadors or advocates or influencers to promote their products more than on any other platform so these are kind of like the key things that um you can take away from instagram and you know like how to use it and how to uh, manage those expectations of your audience and when it comes to um facebook um so for facebook um 
Facebook is quite specific and when it comes to um, you know community management it's a little bit different than other platforms because Facebook is a little bit more you know kind of one-way stream of communication still because if you are a page you actually can't really go to your fans and start like a personal conversation only the users can actually reach out to you um, but um, the platform is really popular you know um, in the community of the users uh, who are looking for new content especially when they're I like to call it a little bit like when they're bored or having a break and you know for um, a typical Facebook user uh, the content has to be um, you know, everything like it has to be fun, uh, you know, it has to be kind of engaging, it has to be quite emotional, there has to be storytelling. Um, when people actually log into Facebook, um, the reason is, like I said, you know, it's they're a little bit bored or they're having a break or, you know, they're just kind of queuing somewhere, they're waiting in a line. So they're trying to kind of, you know, um, kill some time a little bit. Um, and you should be, you know, that page or that brand, you know, providing something a little bit entertaining. Like that, that is really a requirement. Now, obviously the biggest strength of Facebook when it comes to community management is uh, or are the groups. And groups are actually, um, you know, a great resource for um, Facebook. Uh, because, um, you know, they're just li literally so big. Um, and Facebook has found that if users um, really engage, you know, in a group, um, then they're kind of like never leaving Facebook. Like they will always, you know, stay on Facebook. So um, that's just definitely the biggest strength in community management for Facebook. And um, when it comes to Twitter, um, Twitter is also very specific um, as a community management tool. Um, and well, Twitter has a very different back background from other platforms. So first of all, it's all about the media, the publishing, and as well as the, uh, the entertainment industry. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit different from Instagram, which is very aspirational, very branded. And you will typically have lots of personal brands on Twitter and thought leaders, and then you would have, you know, some businesses. And for the personal brands, it's kind of like um, a lot of people just love to come to uh, Twitter and just really, it's kind of nicely said probably now, like express themselves uh, and their thoughts and ideas. Uh, and, you know, sometimes actually, you know, they can be ranting quite a lot. Um, and you know venting as well so when there is something going on wrong with a company um, you know that they I don't know bought something or they didn't like their service a common Twitter user will be quite outspoken about it so um, that's like a big exclamation mark for a lot of brands that if they are on Twitter they should really closely monitor um, you know, any of these conversations, people can get a little bit, sometimes actually quite nasty, to be honest. And, you know, for a good brand on Twitter, um, what's really important is, you know, that uh, you provide a lot of support and that you are very transparent in terms of your communication um, and that you are really responsive if you decide to be on Twitter because people expect you to, um, you know, respond very, very quickly. So, so yeah, so these are the platforms and, you know, this is what they are, um, you know, this is what they are really all about. Um, so what I would like to do next and show you, there are you know, just a few different um, ways how um, social, um, how community manage how community management can help you um you know kind of build your community and how it's you know what are the tools that you can use even for free and like you know how you can actually start building your what i like to call a social brand so let's have a look at that um the first thing that you could do 
um, is what I what is called social listening. Um, so let's have a look at first of all like what that is. So social listening is um, basically um, looking at what people are saying online and you know what kind of like would you and basically you're looking at different interactions like comments you know and public posts and you are as a as a brand you are taking that and using that to your advantage and there are definitely lots of ways how you can you know really benefit from social listening so first of all is that you know your audience will tell you you know okay these are you know like this is the content that we like because you're going to see that you know the content that has a lot of comments will typically be the quote unquote popular uh, content. So you can look at your competitors and you know see that, oh, this is really something interesting. This is something that our brand should be um, talking about um, as um, you know on our um, social media. So first it can give you just a really good in insight into um, you know your content. So that's the first benefit. Um, it also helps you to build relationships. Uh, with customers or clients uh, simply by responding to their messages, to their comments. This is a really, really important part. So um, I would say that it's probably one of the most overlooked parts because when there is an emerging new brand, I would see very frequently that um, the new brand, you know, uh, simply does not respond to all comments below their posts especially when those posts are actually positive, which may be a little bit surprising. It's like you would think maybe that people don't really want to respond, you know, to comments that are going to be negative, you know, or they're going to be like really some sort of a bad feedback. Um, but actually, it's quite the opposite. Um, people, you know, the, the brands typically actually forget to respond to something like, oh, I really love this. And actually, it's as important that you respond to those, um, you know, as as much as you know you would do any negative feedback. So keep that in mind. Um, if you ever get any positive feedback, and don't just say thank you. That's that's a good start, okay. But you know, try to be a little bit more like, oh, thanks a lot, you know, and um, you know whatever they said, the thank you for, like, um, or sorry, so whatever they said, like they complimented you for. Um, you know, whatever your post was about, kind of try to maybe even ask a question back. So if they are saying, um, you know, that, um, I don't know, oh, I really love this post or I really love this product and just say thank you. Uh, say, oh, yeah, we put a lot of thought into it. What do you think is the best thing about this product? Yeah, so um, try to kind of maybe even respond back with a question because then people, you know, it, you're like trying, you're actually building a conversation there. Um, so another thing about social listening is that you can actually start, you know, looking at what your competitors are doing wrong. So um, you could, you know, you could have a look, um, you know, um, like what are, the, what is the feedback from their customers on Facebook? You have like a whole section on feedback and, you know, on um, where people can kind of rate the page and the service and, you know, or, or the, the company. And, um, you know, look at the feedback, look at what people are saying about this brand and, um, then, you know, try to look at what are the most negative things and what are the most positive things. So the most positive things is obviously what you should be already doing. But if you see there is something quite negative that people say about the brand, also try to look at it as that, okay, so if it's repeating, you know, if it's like a thing that happens repeatedly, you know, we are going to put that in place. And um also you know anything like um common complaints you know you could also turn them into any like um uh common um into opportunities for your brand so if some you know if there is a competitor and you know you see um you know people are typically complaining a lot about um their shipping just try to offer your community you know your audience and your clients or customers, the best shipping, you know, available. 
Um, and finally, you know, there could be also industry trends that you can actually learn from social listening. Um, and um, I would say that probably like one of these trends that has been going around in the past probably a year, and I would say even more during the, you know, all the lockdowns with um, the coronavirus uh, would be like in, in the beauty industry would be all these do it yourself at home kits. Uh, you know, so like obviously people couldn't go to a hair salon. So, you know, there were lots of like, I don't know, like hair shine serums that, you know, would kind of um, be as, you know, a, a different way for a hair treatment in salon or, you know, for nails, etc. cetera. So um, try to kind of listen to what people are saying and you can also turn it into a great opportunity. Now I'm going to run you just very quickly and show you a few couple, you know, like a couple of ways where you you know like where you can actually do all this social listening so um you know basically it would be quite simple for all of these tools uh, i mean for all of the social media platforms for instagram facebook and twitter and um as when it comes to instagram you, you know you can just use the search tool and you just you know type in the search um you know you start looking for keywords or hashtags and what's going to come up are, um, you know, accounts and tags in different places with that particular uh, keyword in it. So, you know, try to have a look at like what people are saying when they, you know, are using a specific hashtag. So that can really help you, especially hashtags can be a great resource for you because you can actually follow hashtags. So start maybe following a couple of hashtags that are related to your uh, business, your brand, you know, it could be so, you know, something like, um, I don't know, um, it could be something like, um, you know, book lovers and you're selling books, you're a bookstore. Uh, so basically you just want to really see, you know, what people are interested in, um, you know, what kind of books, you know, so that could be, you know, your way and you can follow the hashtag and you're going to be receiving all that content right away to your home feed. So that's how you would do it. Um, with Facebook, it's honestly a little bit more complicated. I mean, the search tool, it's just, I mean, obviously search tool works, but it's just like not so native and it doesn't kind of, you know, um, it is not so commonly used for really searching for keywords, but you can definitely try it and do that. And it's actually it's actually quite surprising what comes up when you actually use the search tool. So, you know, you can actually see different posts, photos, videos that people have posted. So if I search for coffee magazine, um, you know, I would see all the posts, photos and videos from people who have posted, um, you know, under this um, keyword. And, um, you know, I would also see, for example, pages. I could look at pages um, that would be listed under this um, keyword. So again, if it was um, Facebook, um, you know, Facebook, uh, pay, uh, sorry, if it was um, coffee magazines, you know, in that case, um, you know, I would see all the different um, like magazines that have a page or are related to coffee. So yeah, and there would be lots more. Also groups, and I would say that groups, again, as your search tool uh, for community management would be probably the most powerful on Facebook. So you could simply, um, you know, you could simply, um, look at the different groups that are available under the keyword that you were that you ch that you chose again it could be um coffee magazine and um you would see all the different groups under coffee yeah you could join them and see what people are talking about like maybe they're looking for equipment maybe they're looking for coffee tips um what kind of competitors they talk about you know um anyways like you could learn basically all these different things um you know from facebook and i and i would say that um using the groups uh for community management for for the social listening would be the best and twitter is also uh, obviously you can use the search tool and i think that what's quite specific about the search is that you can search for keywords first of all but also for um hashtags 
and you are going to find all the different content where people used this keyword. Uh, so if I use, for example, a keyword um, books, you know, I would get all the different content where the word books was actually used or the hashtag was used. And um, what I think is really beneficial is that you can actually filter all these posts by a location. So, you know, um, you could, if you're a local, um, you know, if you are a local um, bookstore, basically what you could do is that you could search for the keyword books and see what kind of books people in your area are actually talking about. And then, you know, you could say that you could actually bring these uh, different books up, you know, in, um, you know, the different, um, uh, you could bring these up, you know, in, in your different posts or content, and you could simply talk about these books, you know, so it would be kind of bringing something that people really want to hear about. Yeah, so, um, so I think that's like you, this is probably the most basic thing that you could do with community management. Um, but what I would like to show you is um, one more thing. And that would be all the different, you know, special content features that you could use at the moment. Now, obviously, um, you know, the tools on social media um, they can change from time to time, but most of the time they're actually quite similar and like they, you know, they stay like, for example, you know, Instagram stories have evolved a lot over, you know, the past few years. Um, now we have, you know, um, Boomerang there and you can do also the new, fe the newest feature is called Reels, which is a competitor to TikTok, you know, so it's always evolving. But the key, you know, with using different social media tools, the ones that are specific to each platform, is like, you know, knowing how to use them very creatively. And sometimes if you are very creative with using these tools, it can be absolutely great, you know, for starting a conversation and creating a lot of engagement within your community. So let's have a look at those. And I'm going to start with... Um, Instagram and you know a couple of great case studies so um, this is a case study from WeWork which is um, a global um, community uh, sorry which is a global um, co-working center um, and so what what this co-working center is very well known for is that um, they actually um, allow you to take your dog to your office. And in the US, there is something that they call the National Mutt Day. And basically the National Mutt Day is that um, it's the National Mixed Breed uh, Dog Day. Yeah, so if you have like a mixed breed dog, then they call it the Mutt Day. And anyway, so, you know, they launched this campaign in their stories. And basically there was this picture of the first dog who would say, do you know what today is and the second dog responds today is national mutt day and then you had this video of this guy um um whose uh, handle is mtsler and he called himself a professional quote unquote uh, instagram illustrator now the whole idea was very simple how they wanted to engage their community was to they were asking people to simply send pictures of their dogs um, and tag them, uh, tag a WeWork, um, and basically then um, they, um, when they, you know, received any of those pictures that, you know, they were tagged in, um, this guy would transform these pictures into something quite funny. So what you could find here would be something like this. You know, you would see on the left-hand side, you can see a dog, you know, he's just like a regular dog, it's just like a picture of a dog. They tagged WeWork and then um, the professional illustrator turned it into this picture in the middle, you know, and the dog is kind of like, looks like a, it's like a James Bond, but his name is James Bones. Uh, and then it says, actually, it's Charlie. And so it was kind of cute and funny. Uh, it was a great opportunity for WeWork because basically what they did, they really engaged with a lot of users. 
um, the users would mention them, their community would be kind of like, you know, expanding, growing, and um, the brand awareness was definitely rising. There was actually a similar company. I mean, this was a fashion, uh, this is a fashion company, um, Acid Maison Kitsune. And what they did, they have this like a logo of a fox. So they did a very similar and simple thing. They simply provided a template of that fox. Um, and then um, they let actually people color it. So you would have this picture, you would go to your Instagram stories and you would open that picture. And then with the drawing tool, you could kind of color your own, um, you know, cute little fox, which is actually the logo. Um, so that was another really great way. And then um, there are different ways, obviously, that are a little bit simpler on Instagram. I mean, I think Instagram is really easy for engagement. Um, so, you know, this is a this is a brand called Shower Cap. Um, they sell shower caps. It's very simple, you know, just like the ones that you go into the shower so you're wet, so your um, hair doesn't get wet. Um, and you know what you can what what they do quite frequently are these polls. So very simple. It's like, which one do you prefer? You know, they, they are very well known for the shower caps to have like limited um, edition designs. And, you know, it would be, you know, do you prefer this one over that one? Um, you know, or it would be basically, um, you know, asking people to send them a direct message or something like that. So, you know, it's just like a very simple way. Um, this is another example from Planoly for this is a scheduling tool for Instagram um, and what they did and what they do quite frequently is that um, they post just a regular normal post on Instagram and um, one of the things that they do is um, it's like a GIF image so you know it's like a kind of like a video and let's say that the you know the, the the theme of that picture or of that post would be like which classic book are you and you know the the um, the picture kind of changes like it's it's a video so it would have all these different co covers of the most popular books um and so basically you take a print screen with your iphone and then in the comments below you would let know the brand that you know I am the classic book, I don't know, like Ernest Hemingway. Yeah, so uh, that's one of the ways how they kind of um, ask people to be more active and comment more. Um, so it's like a really great way how they do that. So I'm going to just um, show you a few more things about um, how you can engage your users with community management. And then I'm actually going to answer some of your questions. Um, so, Moving on to Nike, I really love Nike and they're such a great example of community management. So, you know, in case you want to really improve your community management yourself, um, then I highly, highly recommend that, you know, you follow Nike. And again, this is a quite simple way, you know, how they do it. So, uh, you know, they would kind of give different tips in their stories. And, you know, they would have, they would be a little bit more interactive, you know, there would be a video. And then, you know, some of those posts would be, again, you know, featuring some of the tools uh, that are specific to Instagram, such as ask us a question. And, you know, so in this case, they had, you know, a running coach um, giving advice to runners. And then at the end, you could simply ask uh, a question, you know, to this coach. So, um it was a super simple but engaging way, um, you know, how to connect with the community. Um, on Facebook, I would say that, um, um, you know, on Facebook, I would say that it's a little bit, you know, harder to create engagement, but actually people kind of forget about just the basic post tool where you can actually add, for example, things like how you're feeling or um, like what you're up to, uh, or you could actually ask even people to donate for a charity. Yeah, so there are lots of different tools that Facebook allows you to do, um, like even, you know, um, for example, yes, yeah, support a nonprofit, or you could also tag a place, um, you know, so that's one of the ways how you could do it. Um, so just you just have to be a little bit creative. And they also have this like um, 
list tool. So for example, you could say, this is the best advice I've ever received and you could create a list. It's just simply more like a little bit different and it creates more engagement. But obviously, like I said, you know, the biggest advantage, um, the biggest advantage, um, you know, of Facebook are the groups. And um, if you want, there is probably this one big tip and that really sums it up about Facebook groups um, is that never create a Facebook group you know, just to promote your business, that should never be the case. It should actually always be about the community. So create a Facebook group only once you have a number of brand um, ambassadors and advocates who actually want to talk about, you know, the things that they're interested in, like the community thing or the topic, um, and let them really shine in the group. Let them post, you know, let them uh, post something interesting and let, you know, the less experienced users join your group and um, you know ask questions and have somebody in the community to help them out. That's what makes a good group. I see that the biggest mistake for businesses is when they're actually trying to promote you know, their business. And the final way, probably on Twitter, um, there is just this little tool. I mean, they have polls, so you know you can create like just a poll you can see this on the right in the right hand picture. Um, so you could create a poll like, I don't know, where do you live or, you know, anything like that. And you could list a couple of places. And the other tool that you could use um, are the lists. So you can go to your profile and uh, you could create lists. It's just right under your profile. And the lists are basically, it's like a stream where you can add other accounts. Um, you know that you actually do not follow but really the key to creating lists is giving those lists kind of flattering name so let's say i would say something like the best people in publishing in london you know and then i would add people who are publishers or from the publishing industry or write or writers and you know i would add them and a little bit of like flattery um you know goes a long way because people get a notification when they're added to a list and they get interested in you. They'll be like, who added me to a list, you know, the best publishers in London. So, um, you know, that's basically, you know, the way how you could use lists a little bit more creatively and simply connect, you know, to different audiences. So, um, yeah, so I think that this kind of brings it, you know, um, at least the content for, um, you know, the community management and using it for engagement for today. So what I would like to do, I would just like to answer some questions now. So I'm just going to go through your questions, guys, and, you know, see what kind of uh, things you're asking. So let me just go um, and see your questions. Right. So um, what is your number one tip for starting out as a freelance community manager? So I would say, um, well, first, get a little bit familiar with the platforms and really know how people use them. Um, and I'd say, well, freelance community manager. Um, yeah, you know what, what I would do, um, and I think, I mean, this is what I did. Um, just go ahead, find brands that you really love. Maybe it could be even a local business and you know do something for them or kind of show them you know that this is how i could transform your brand online and basically give them like a good you know um showcase of what you would do and maybe you could actually get a job with them i think that's what i would do and i would like contact a number of them i think that would be my best tip and so another question is what is the first thing you do to look for your target audience? Um, that's a really great question. It's just probably gonna take me a little bit longer to respond. So what I just wanna say is that um, if you are watching this on Instagram, um, that this, um, this um, video on Instagram is going to finish in approximately about four minutes. So um, you can still keep us sending us your questions uh, and I'm going to respond to them. But the um, 
the video is going to finish soon, soon so but you can you can still keep in touch and you can still ask your questions right so back to the question so what is the first thing you do to look for your target audience um my first thing and it's also a part of the course that i've created with domestica is market research so um i really you know like to say that um, your perception of your target audience should never be based on what you think or assume about your target audience. It should be really based on data, and that is research. So um, basically, you just do research. Um, you ask questions. What I, what I really suggest you do is interview your target audience. So try to look for people who are within your target audience. Um, you know, they would be the people... Um, you know, buying products that you're offering or, you know, um, the services that you're offering and ask them some relevant questions like, you know, would they, um, you know, prefer about brands? Would they really don't like about brands? Would they value about service? Basically, that's, you know, what, um, you know, what I would do. Uh, what type of metrics or results do you show your clients? That's a brilliant question. So um, I really love that. Um, and the reason I say that is because, you know, clients ask about these all the time uh, and it can be very um, easy to kind of get into, you know, the habit of showing too many things that are not relevant when it comes to numbers. So um, the way I go around metrics and any results is first when I start working with a client, I actually look at and I really discuss with them thoroughly what are their goals. Yeah, because goals are actually going to show me what their aim is, what they really care about and what we should measure. So and then I basically just focus on that. Um, so, you know, I could probably choose like up to three different metrics that we would track and measure over a period of time, typically at least for three months and see how they're improving. So I wouldn't say, you know, it's like just this one thing, but it could be a couple of things and it was always depend on the client. Now, because we are in community management, specifically for social media, it would be um, more likely, um, you know, based around engagement and engagement rate, I think like that would come up quite you know, possibly quiet frequently, but it could be also things like, um, you know, the number of private messages, um, because those are, you know, typically where you get leads and people are asking about the product. Um, yeah, thanks, Aaron. Thanks for saying it's interesting. I'm glad you've liked it. So what other apps do you think exist to share your product? Um, you know, I mean, community management can be really broad. And as long as it's social platform and anything where there is an interaction or there is input, community sharing is actually considered social media. So, you know, you could even showcase your, you know, products or basically I would say more like brand uh, would be using things like Spotify. You know, you could just go on Spotify, create playlists and share them with your community or encourage your community to create some of them. So try to kind of think about, you know, other tools and just think out of outside of the box. Um, I'd say that um, like Spotify can be such a, you know, easy one or also podcasts. So do you have a general approach for every client or it's different every time? Um, so I do have actually a certain structure that I typically follow. Uh, I have a procedure for that that I've written myself and might sound a little bit crazy. Like I have a checklist with each client. You know, I go like, OK, you know, they just um, got interested. So I respond to their email and I want to schedule like um a call with them you know I need to speak to them first and there is a, like a reason for that because uh, for example I typically see that if I don't really speak to a client kind of early on they kind of start to lose their interest because they're not quite sure but if I do speak to them you know I kind of can 
help them maybe you know solve some of the questions that they have about the consultancy or training that i offer um and i can resolve it for them and make it really clear if they want the service or not yes yeah, so um i definitely follow a structure um and there is a reason for that but you know sometimes it happens that every client is a bit different and they just don't really want to get on a phone but they really want the service and they just like get on with it so obviously you can't always do it the same but i try to follow a certain structure uh what are your thoughts on tiktok okay that's that's a good one um so well i don't i didn't actually include tiktok in um you know in the domestica course and i really focused on the key uh three platforms um which are um, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, because they've been around the most. Now, you know, every now and then, uh, there is a new platform that kind of arises, it's really popular. And I love that, you know, it's just so beautiful that there is still something new going on. Um, but I would say that for most companies, TikTok is a little bit off. Yeah, so when it comes to companies, it's just not really the way they're looking for, you know, to promote themselves unless they're there is the, like a fun you know and they can produce a lot of video content so if they're not like a very young type of a company that can produce lots of fun videos and kind of doesn't really fit into your um you know um branding i would say it's a little bit off and another thing is that what happens quite often with emerging brands is that uh, i mean emerging social media platforms and basically brands um, is that they kind of typically, you know, have this initial boom and then it can kind of, you know, go to like stagnant and, um, you know, doesn't have to be that for a long time. So um, that could be also a big problem. So if I'm working with a brand that hasn't launched yet, what are your tips for engaging and building an audience in the meantime? Right. So this is a very good question. Um, and it's, yeah, that's a very common question I get. So um, if you are, you know, working with a brand, they haven't launched yet, um, you know, they have a new product, but they basically just like a month to launch. So first of all, really try to create a lot of content that's kind of, um, you know, going to help to promote the brand first and start building that community. Now, I would say that, um, you know, people are not really that interested in following you, especially on Instagram, when um, they can't really see what you are selling. So um, my tip would be, you know, give them at least a little bit of hint about what you are and create content that is really going to be interesting for them. So I actually have a client right now, she's going to launch something really cool, which I can't really talk about. But what I can tell you is that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hair styling product. And, you know, she, you know, has created this product, she has a launch, you know, planned. So until then, she has created a lot of cool uh, content, like posted every day, um, that will really interest any women who are into, you know, hairstyling. Like it's it's just really a really beautiful content. Like it's visually beautiful. Um, you know, it has great quotes. It has great captions, and she will also try to engage. So she's going to follow certain users from hashtags that are relevant. Also use, um, you know, hashtags that are relevant. So basically really try to, um, you know, find a way how you can start a conversation with the right people on the platform. Yeah, so I think that would be my best advice. Okay, so I think that these will be all of our questions for today. So thank you so much for joining. And thank you so much for watching, you know, this Domestica Live with me today. Um, it was really my pleasure to, you know, spend this over an hour with you. And yeah, if you have, you know, any questions in community management, um, feel free to drop them at Hannah J. Glockner on Instagram or 
Um, also, I'm on LinkedIn, but um, the course for community management will be coming out soon, and I'm really excited about. Um, I think I've put a, you know, like a lot of work with domestic kind to it, and I think it's going to be a brilliant course. So I hope to see you very soon um, as our students. So that would be amazing to see you. So thanks a lot, and I'm going to see you soon. Bye bye. I'm going to show you some examples. This is what we've got behind me. ¿Qué más preguntas tengo por aquí? ¿Cómo descubriste que los niños están ahí?